Yeah, when Jesus returns. Okay. Good morning and welcome to, uh, I hope it's morning while you're watching this. Anyway, welcome to uh, Faith Family United Church of Christ uh, Studies in Luke. Um, we're going through the book of Luke and we're taking our notes and we're going to put them together and do a commentary, a, a common commentary on what we read and how we can apply it to our lives. So we are now on lesson 5.5. Originally, I had a lot bigger lessons, um, and uh, we were going to go through it quickly, but we decided to, to slow it down and go through it more slowly and uh, go through each um, story and look at each story. So this is in chapter, or excuse me, in lesson five, this is the five, the fifth, <laughs> the fifth uh, iteration of chapter five. Um, so if you have the old uh, uh, syllabus or uh, breakdown, we're in chapter five, or we're in lesson five, and this is part five of it. And we're starting in Luke chapter eight, verse 40 through 56 is our first um, our first uh, scripture. Let me pull this up so you can see it. Let's make it big. Make it big. There we go. That's not what we wanted. I'm sorry. He's really still at it. Don't tell anybody about it. That's his favorite quote. What's that? Jesus saying that, you know, he charged them to tell no one what had happened. <laughs> he charged, yeah. It's, it's funny because it's almost like he wanted to keep everything a secret. Did you get the King James Version of that? No, that's the New Revised Standard. Okay, so we're, where are we at? Where Jesus has just come away from healing the man from that garrison, uh, the garrison demoniac, and he returns to, um, I guess, near uh, into Galilee, which Galilee is actually a province, so it's, it's like a county, but he's returning to, to south of that or heading towards Jerusalem. Um, probably near Nazareth or some such place like that. And so it says uh, Jesus returned. So he, he's left the, the area of the garrisons and he's returning um, to his home area. Um, and he comes to a man named Jairus. He is a synagogue leader. And he falls at Jesus' feet, feet, feet and uh, pleads with him to come and to look at his daughter because she is uh, about ready to die and Jesus was on his way and notice it says the crowds almost crushed him and then later on he, he's uh, it, and it, the story is kind of interrupted there and it says that a woman touches Jesus and he said who touched me and notice what Peter says master the people are crowding and pressing against you like how, how can you say of course someone touched you right so Jesus is walking the crowd is so large he's getting crushed and a woman touches him in the crowd and Jesus notices this with the crowd so thick how do you how do you how did Jesus know someone touched him he felt the loss of power was it a loss of power? Well, he, he, he said power went out from me. That's right. You know, yeah. I felt power discharging from me. Yeah. yeah. It has gone forth from me. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So that's interesting. He said he noticed it because power came from him. Not didn't Power didn't come from him when people were crushing against him, but power came from him when the woman touched him. Uh, don't you think that many people touched him? And yet they didn't have power come to them. But she, they were not of the same emotional part that she was. Okay. 
she had an issue that was emotional, maternal, and you know whatever. They that was going on for years. Precisely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. She's been she's been subject to bleeding for years, and um, her her been menstruating uh, for 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 years, and it's never stopped. And um, and yet, you know, she said to herself, "If I just touch him." Uh, none of the other people were, were looking for something. But she had the faith that that's what it was. That's yeah. what she needed. And, and that's, that was the question. Why do, you, why do you think this is different? The woman touch is different. And that was because she had faith that he could heal her. Or the other people, they were just there. To One speak. came from the music and the other, she came for the sermon. <laughs> okay, that's a good way to put it. I mean, you think about it. You, you, you've seen people like celebrities and everything. They walk through, and, and all the people want to do is, is I just want to touch them, you know? Right, I just right. want to touch him. Ah! Oh, and then I touched him, I touched him. And probably the same thing happening here. You know, people people run home and tell their, yeah, I touched Jesus. I human touched nature. Well, even, even in like the State of the Union, when the president walks in to Congress, everybody's reaching out just to, just to, just to get a handshake or uh -huh. whatever. And, so, so I, I, I wanted to touch on a little bit, what, what do you think this, this power that went out from Jesus, what do you think that was? Sometimes when you shake hands with somebody, you get a connection. And okay. It's, it's just something happens, and in this case, Jesus provided healing to this woman, even though he perhaps didn't realize he was doing it, but when she touched him, he felt that that could be like... Almost like it's not its not necessarily Jesus doing it. Right. It's the faith the of faith. the woman who actually pulled the... Pulled the Correct. Um, what do you say? Power from him. The energy. Yeah, people are sick in the hospital. The doctor says it's a miracle. It's because sometimes the person just had faith and felt that they could be cured. Now, there's, there's today. There's some. Uh, it'd be called pseudoscience, but there's some scientists that believe that we have auras. Mm -hmm. That is, that we have energy. Of course, that's what our body is made. You know, is, mm -hmm. is run off of. You know, our hearts, an energy yes. source. You know, it sends. And so they, they, they think that we have this energy in us, and it. Sometimes you can see that the people say they can see the auras or the energy that surrounds a person. Um, do you think that this is something that she was able to tap into to Jesus? Let me say this first before I ask that question. Um, do you think that people today talk about being empathetic? What does that mean? That means that they can feel someone else's energy like if you have a you have a negative energy they would on they would suddenly become uh, negative or if you have a sad energy they would become sad and they so they can empath empathize Isn't with that you. like psychics do that yeah kind of like that and so that, that that's that idea of, of touching someone else's energy and um, do you think that, that that is something that we can that we can uh, apply to this, or or is it, or do we just say no because this was Jesus, and Jesus is you know God incarnate, and that's the energy, God's energy that the woman was pulling from. I, I guess the challenge is that it was a crowd of people, and how would you be able to? You know, I could sense sometimes at a tax desk how I need to interact with someone based upon body language, energy, or however it is, but I can I can just sense it. Mm -hmm. But that's one person. If that was a crowd of hundreds, I don't know. I wouldn't have a hard sense to see that. Whereas perhaps Jesus could. Well the interesting thing is he didn't know who, where it went. Right. He just knew it it, it that went. shocked me. I don't understand that part. You know? <laughs> or was that a test to the woman to see if yeah. she was going to be honest about it? I, I, I think that, that he knew someone had touched her, uh, touched him. You know, he said he felt the power leave him. Uh -huh. So we assume that he's telling the truth. 
and he had a feeling that this woman touched him and that he healed her and it took something from him to heal her. He had to do something and he did. Take it another way, our behavior, our, our actions daily, we never know how they're going to be influencing someone else. And so Jesus, just being Jesus, influenced this woman to touch. And once that happened, Jesus knew something happened, but didn't know who amongst them was the one that received. Just the same way you or I do a good thing, or just a normal thing for us, and we're having ways that have positive effects on people. It's showing that, that Jesus did something. Yeah. All right? I mean, because the woman touched him, he healed her, but it wasn't just, you're healed. Yeah. Just physically something happened. Yeah, I think that's, that's a good point to this, is that it's not just, it's not just all mental. There's actually something that took place here. A power, yeah, a power came out of him and, and healed her. So, so yeah, I think that's a good point there. I'm not going any further. Okay. <laughs> you want me to? I will. No, no, that's okay. If you want to. Well, it, it's, it's, we try to reconcile science to religion. And science, uh, some of the rules of, 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 of thermodynamics are science. And the first rule of thermodynamics is that is energy can neither be created nor destroyed, but it can be changed. So some of Christ's energy left him, went to the woman who is energy, and healed her. That's a reconciliation of science and religion, mm -hmm. and, and, and in the words of Jesus, yeah, we didn't call it science. Yeah, and that's something. And that's something that where where science and religion get in cahoots with each other is religion. They see they see something, and they know it happened. They experience something. They don't understand it, but they experience something. And science says it's not valid unless we can reproduce it again and again and again. And so since science can't reproduce some of the things that are claimed in religion, then that's that, that's where they butt heads. Mm -hmm. Or where they meet. Or, or it could be it where could they be meet. It's where they meet. I mean, because, I, I put my hands like this. Well, okay. Because what happens a lot of times is science goes down the road and oh we didn't know this now we know this and all of a sudden wow that that comes closer to like 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 um, Bill was saying you know they start growing closer together when we understand you know and and we uh, religion talks a different language than science and so we have to we have to think about that as well um, the, the, what is the what is the language we're talking in religion, and how does it how does it compare? Almost like you have to translate it. For years, no, go ahead. I was going to say science is alive and, and moving on. It's mm -hmm. today, where scripture is hundreds of years ago, thousands, you know. Uh -huh. So but sometimes there's conflict. So we have to be able to reconcile that together by. In the United Church of Christ, there's never been a period where God, because God is still speaking, sure. so we have to understand the Bible. And not all, not all faiths will. What do you want to say? Mesh that together. They, exactly. They're they're rigid and say we can't believe that science. Well, okay. Well, and then and, and, and like you were saying, uh, this is experiences in the past. Mm -hmm. We can't go back in in the past and do the experiments then. Exactly. So we got to try to. And if we can't make them, then we say, oh, well, what we have to change our, our thinking about that. I, 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 I want to say something that I think is, is fundamental. We didn't have the first law of thermodynamics when the church started. Right. Okay? We didn't understand it. Exactly. All right? Now, it's not a religion. It's a scientific 
That's the full assertion. Okay? Now, which means it's right. It's correct. Just because it's not in the Bible doesn't make it wrong. Correct. The church for years fought science. Right. Mm -hmm. Now the Catholic Church also became a mentor of sciences. And they realized the value of it. So I think we're at a point in our life where the church and science, and I include even Darwin in this, all right? I'm not saying what's right and what's wrong, but we have to get together and say, we're not talking a different, we are talking a different language. We are all saying the same thing. Now, I think science is an explanation of how God did certain things. That's my own opinion. Sure. I, I think I, I want to I correct you. I just want to say, I think that we they are talking a different language. They're saying the same thing, but they're talking a different language, and that's what makes it difficult to merge. But if a communication is defined by the response that it elicits, mm -hmm. science says it this way, and we understand this. Religion says a different way, and we understand this. Whoa, wait a minute. What's, what's the difference? Exactly. And they're both saying the same thing. We're saying thing. the same thing. Same, exactly. But they're doing it a little differently. And here, the Greek word for energy, I think it's Greek, isn't it? I don't know. I haven't looked. I haven't looked it up, so I missed it. Power. What, what, what is that power? What's that word in Greek? Uh, in Greek, uh, I think that's the word. Uh, uh, power. Power is in 487. 747. No, not in, I'm sorry. Oh, there it is, 40, 46. Okay. Power, dunamis, yep, I, as I thought it was going to be that. Dunamis is power. And? It means uh, the meaning or significant of the word or statement, meaning what is intended. What's the word for energy in Greek? I love translations. Weird, but the, and it says, "Yet all can be understood, or yet all have meaning." Perform an activity, mighty deed or miracle. Hmm, interesting. It means the ability or power <coughs> or mighty deed, supernatural power. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Omniscience is one of the suggestions here. Anyway. So, we can see that something happened and, and it was experienced, and we can look back now through our scientific and say, this is what could have happened. This is what is possibly happened. So, okay, I wanted to, I wanted to touch on this because it is Mother's Day. And uh, notice here, what is the man's name that Jesus, that came to Jesus right away? Remember him? The beginning of the story before this woman. Jairus? Jairus. And he is a synagogue leader, right? An elder of the church. Of yeah. the synagogue. Yeah. yeah. What is the woman's name? Did not mention. I don't remember her name. Her name is A. Is what? A. It says A woman. Oh, A woman. <laughs> I know her very well. This is this is this is this is hard, and this is why a lot of feminists have a problem. There's a lot of there's a lot of women that aren't named in the Bible, and uh, 
they, they have to do something extraordinary. And, and obviously, um, this was this was extraordinary, but she didn't get a name. And so I, I think that uh, I wish Cindy was here. I wanted Cindy to be here and, and some, some women to be here. Just got all men here right now. But I wanted to say, what was, what, uh, what was the name? What was, um, what do you think about women not being named in the Bible? Second class culture, just like right up is where the women's votes and so forth. It's not a right and wrong thing. You've got to place it in the context of the time. It's correct to criticize it today because society has changed today. Because you have to understand it in the terms of society when it was written to get the full meaning of the Bible. Mm -hmm. It plays into the history of women not being able to vote and women being marginalized, women being paid less. And and I, and I think it's something, as a society, we work to make progress with, but I feel badly for people that can't, I don't want to say get over it, but you get affected by the fact that you were marginalized all your life, exactly. but if you carry that with you, it's just going to be a burden, you, you got to move forward. Aren't there some cultures where as soon as a child's born, ah! There's another girl. Well, it's very common use of reason out there. Oh, I need a boy for the farm. I need a boy to whatever. Yeah. Well, to carry on the name. Yes. Yeah. Having two daughters and no sons. I have a stepson. Uh, I, I, I don't relate to this personally. I you understand don't? it. I don't relate to it. Yeah. I think I think that's the thing that we need to understand is is now is it was a cultural thing mm -hmm. and this is the way they talked and that should not change the fact that we see women as equal and and as 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 not as marginalized if you will we are on this then. table see women as equal exactly in the, in the society we live in that's still not the case and, and it's because people want to resort back to the understanding back then right. that women were, for no better terminology, back then women were basically property. There is a history before this book of society, people walking around the earth and hitting each other over the head with clubs and <laughs> having babies and all that. This, this feeling of superiority of men because they're the stronger sex, physically mm -hmm. stronger sex, um, carries forward from the caves to today. It's about time we got rid of it, but yeah. you know. Right. And, I, and I think that we, we mm -hmm. as a progressive group, are trying to do that. You know, we talk about equality and equality across the board, and that's the way it should be. And uh, and to, to, to have people point to things in the Bible and say, it says here, you know, women shouldn't talk in church and, and all these other things where they try to put women back into their place. Yeah. That, that, let me throw up the air quotes there because I wouldn't say something like that. Look at the cultures where all you can see is the eyes, you know. You know, the hair is covered, the nose, everything else, just the eyes are shown. Yeah. And they walk three steps behind. And that's that, that you're talking a different uh, yes. religion, but, yeah. But again, yeah. it's the it's the idea of subjugating women. To okay, I don't want to beat that. I just wanted to bring that up and yeah. point out that here's a, here's another time when the Bible doesn't name a woman. Um, one more thing on this story I wanted to talk about was notice what when Jesus gets there and they said, "Don't worry, she's dead." Um, you know, you don't have to do anything. And Jesus says, no, she's not dead. She's asleep. And it says, they laughed at him. They laughed at him. Kata gelao is to make fun of or ridicule by laughing. What do you think about that? So now these were think about that. Now, let's think about that. A 12-year-old girl has just died, and they're 
laughing at someone that's trying to say she's not dead. Solemn, solemn uh, situation, I mean, atmosphere, and they're laughing. What do you make of that? They didn't have much faith in Jesus, did they? Well, that's, that's one way to look at that. Was she just a piece of chattel, too? I don't think that, I don't think it, I don't think that's here. I think that uh, well I don't want to say what I think. I want to see what you guys think. Maybe they thought Jesus had more important things to do than to worry about this little girl. Okay. So go away. But he says she's not dead, and they laugh at him for that. Well, they, they, remember they don't they weren't following Jesus necessarily. They are just a crowd of people. Okay. And they saw she's dead. She's not breathing. She's she's gone. <laughs> you can you can, you can what? Yeah. Who is this? Who is this? Yahoo coming in here and telling us that she's not dead. She's asleep. You don't think we know she's asleep? They yeah. laughed at him because they were non-believers, and this makes it absolutely true. Exactly. Exactly. I think that when we get into situations where we have a lot of emotion that is uh, uh, laughing is is a response that we have um one of the things that that drives me insane is when i'm trying to fix something around the house or something and i've done everything i can think of and i'm like frustrated i'm pulling my hair out and my wife says did you try to uh flip the switch it's like, yeah, that was the first thing I tried, you know, and, and I kind of ridicule her. Or I, I <laughs> laugh at her, you know, because it seems so silly, so, so immature, so somebody doesn't know what they're talking about. And I think that's what we, we have here. And uh, the, to, to do a caveat to that is the, the, uh, the idea that, you're working, you see a mechanic working on a car and he can't figure it out, can't figure it out. And somebody just walks by and goes, uh, does it have gas in it? And it's like, of course it has gas. And then he thinks, I wonder if it does have gas in it. And he goes, put gas in it. And boom, fires right up. <laughs> and and uh, so, so here they're ridiculing him because they didn't understand the power that he possessed. And so, uh, but yet, their unbelief didn't deter him from being able to save this little girl. Would you agree with that? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's not just not. That, that phrase is in there to show that the people didn't believe in Jesus. And also to magnify, or to, yeah, to make it more impressive when he, when he does. Well, and, and the next, the next um, story, we're not going to get into it today. But the next story, um, at the very end, it says, um, it says uh, Herod's talking, and he says, who then is this? And he's talking about Jesus. And I think this is building up to that. These, these last couple of verses or uh, stories is building up to that, to get ready to answer that question. Who is this Jesus? And here, they laugh at him because not only did they not have faith, but they didn't know who he was. Notice that the author did not say, and she got up. The author said, and her spirit returned, and she got up. Yes. All right, so. And he said, he says, her spirit returned, and at once she stood up. Yeah. Jesus only took his trusted apostles and the parents into the room. Yeah. And then tells them to keep quiet about it. Interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. Another question is why do you tell them to keep quiet about it? Well, I think I think it, you have to. I think to answer that question, we have to understand the the Jewish mindset at this time, and that is in Israel they were looking for a Messiah, and a Messiah is an anointed one. That's where we get the word. The Greek word is Christ. But this Messiah that they're looking for, anointed one, if you go back in the first anointed one, 
was the, 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 the prophets of the very first, like Samuel. And Samuel anoints Saul, a king. And so they're looking for a worldly Messiah, a king. And now if Jesus comes and declares, I am the Messiah, they're going to try to make him king. They're going to try to make him this military leader and, and in the middle of Rome. And they, they several hundred years before this time, they went through that with the Maccabee revolt. And they, they, the, the Romans come down hard on them mm. and, uh, because of this. And so it's not time to display that yet. Well, the coronation, know, and, and, a coronation is not a crucifixion. And Jesus yeah, exactly. Wants a crucifixion, so. Yeah, so, so he, he needed to keep it on the lowdown until it was time. And, and part of that timing was getting them to change their ideals of what a Messiah is. So, okay, good. Das is it. Good. We'll, we'll, huh? Das is it. Well, yeah, we'll stop there and we'll do, we'll start with uh, chapter 9 um, next week.